Hello YouTube, Dave here again. Welcome back to another installment in my classic Mod Jeweler Adventure Review series. And uh, this one's all about the deck of many things. This is one of my favorite magic items of all time. In fact, I actually did a video talking about like magic items, and in that video I discussed how much I love the deck of many things. So, uh, for this adventure we're actually going back to 4th edition. Now I know 4th edition was maligned for a lot of different reasons, but one thing that 4th edition did do well was some of their larger published adventures that they did. Uh, so this adventure that we're going to be looking at today is Madness at Gardmore Abbey. Uh, so this came out in 2011 and is a box set which features a replica of the Deck of Many Things. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're just going to have a look at the, uh, the inside. I'll unbox it, show everything that comes inside, give a little brief overview of the adventure itself, and uh, then I'll give my final thoughts. Alright, so before I show off what's inside the box, I just want to have a closer look at the actual packaging itself, because I really loved uh, these boxes that came out during the 4th uh, the edition days. I'm a sucker for box sets, uh, so anything that came in a box was kind of like a must-have uh, once I started collecting for this edition. Uh, I've only got a couple of these, unfortunately, but like I said, I just really love them. Uh, so what we have here, of course, you got your logo, uh, Heroic Tier Adventure. Uh, the title, Madness at Gardenmore Abbey, and then you've got uh, this really cool picture of uh, it's an Etten wearing a Displacer Beast cloak. Uh, looks like a couple of orcs. And uh, down here we've got the symbol includes the deck of many things, which is a sample of what they look like. Uh, the Venture for Characters Level 6 through 8, uh, written by uh, James Wyatt. I uh, love his stuff. Uh, Creighton uh, Broadhurst and Steve Townsend. And then just the sides just have the uh, the Dungeons and Dragons 4th edition logo, the name, and just a uh, picture of the art there. So there's the orc with the great axe over his head on that side. And the other side's actually different, so I never really paid attention to that, but it's a different orc there. <coughs> and on the back, it just kind of shows off a lot of what's inside of this uh, this adventure, or this uh, this box set. But what we've got up here is pick a card, any card. So Gardmore Abbey, once a bastion of a paladin order devoted to Bahamut, this sacred monastery has become a monster-infested ruin. According to legend, the paladins brought back an artifact from a far-off campaign and stored it in the abbey for safekeeping. An evil force has assaulted the abbey in a failed bid to recapture it. What legends don't reveal is that this artifact was the deck of many things. Uh, this Dungeons & Dragons uh, role-playing game adventure lures heroes into the ruins of Gardmore Abbey, a place warped and twisted by the chaotic forces surrounding the deck of many things, forces that transform the location with each successive visit. Uh, so this box set contains four 32-page uh, books describing Gardmore Abbey's inhabitants along with the quests and encounters, two double-sided battle maps uh, depicting key adventure locations, two die-cut sheets of cardstock tokens and dungeon tiles, uh, the Deck of Many Things, 22 cards, plus uh, two exclusive treasure cards. And it just says here, uh, for use of the Dungeons & Dragons Essentials products. Uh, so it's compatible with all those things. Now, um, I know I sort of mentioned this back in my uh, D&D 4th Edition retrospective, but <clears throat> this is also compatible with the hardcover role-playing game as well. So the uh, Player's Handbooks, Dungeon Master's Guide, and all that. Uh, do still work for this. Uh, I don't think they were quite uh, playing up how cross promotion it was with, you know, like how uh, cross promotion is the wrong term. Uh, uh, it, it didn't really play up how compatible it was with the hardcovers. I think they were just trying to really push the essentials line at this point in time. Uh, but that's what we have here. And uh, down in the corner, uh, it was $39.99 US when it came out and $46.99 Canadian. So I kind of missed those prices. Because nowadays you've got uh, like books and stuff, anything that comes out is like 60 some odd dollars now. Uh, so that's just the outside of the box uh, on the top here. It just has the tab, so what we're going to do is, uh, just one moment here. Open that up. And just right on the inside there is where you got your cards. So I'm just going to pull those out. And then, whoop. <clears throat> now you don't probably have to keep the cardboard insert inside like I did. I want to have as much authentic stuff as I can. So here are the tokens, <clears throat> which is really cool for some of the uh, the NPCs, some of the monsters, 
which is really great. There's also some uh, logos here for that represent each of the cards, which does have importance. And then they're, uh, they are all double-sided, so you've got some more of the other ones here as well. So you just got the double-sided uh, tokens for each of those. It's pretty cool. And then you've got some dungeon tiles. So I've never actually taken these out of their, uh, of their packaging. Uh, I think each of these ones are sort of unique, and they didn't have corresponding ones in the uh, tile master sets. So that's what comes in there. And then behind the insert, we have, this should be everything else. Oh. Okay, I'll just make sure that that's, okay, so that's everything. And, oh, okay, uh, I'll show this off a little bit later, but that's something that I did for when I tried to run this adventure. So then we've got basically our books and our two uh, double-sided, uh, I believe they're double-sided, yeah, they're double-sided um, poster maps. Uh, I'm not gonna unfold these all the way just because it's kinda hard to uh, show them off. I might uh, do this on my larger table at, at the end of the video or you know at the end of the section, so. Uh, but right now, we'll just uh, set those aside. So the two maps, they are really nice looking maps. And then we've got our four different books. So book number one, is Gardmore Abbey, and you just kind of flip through, gives you like the background, and sort of the setup, uh, different locations that you can find within the Abbey itself. Uh, book two is Enemies and Allies. Uh, so this just kind of goes and gives you like who your patrons may be, what their motivations may be, uh, as well as some encounters involving uh, notable NPCs, including another adventuring party and some of the enemies that you may encounter. And then books two, uh, three and four are just the encounters. So uh, book one has sort of all the locations. Uh, book two has, you know, your NPCs. And book three and four just kind of go through the different uh, encounters for each of the potential areas, uh, including like tactical maps, um, the breaks down of like tactics and things like that. So that's what's in the four uh, booklets itself and that's what's inside the box itself. Whoops, I cut that off a bit way too soon. Uh, actually, I forgot to show off the, uh, the deck of many things. I thought I already had and the reason was because I did that in a separate video. Uh, but let's just go through again. Again, I like to keep the, uh, all the packaging including the protective sleeve that this stuff comes in. So the, uh, the first two things are magic items that you can find within the adventure itself. So you've got the, uh, the longsword Moonbane that you can find. Uh, so if the player characters come across this, you can give them this card. Uh, so it's plus two longsword, uh, chance attacks and damage rolls. Uh, on criticals, it deals extra 2d8 radiant damage. Uh, and Moonbane is treated as a silvered weapon, which is cool. Uh, deals full damage to insubstantial creatures, which is also great. And as a daily ability, you can teleport up to five squares. Uh, each creature that is adjacent to your destination square takes five radiant damage. So you can actually like teleport into the middle of a group of enemies and deal some damage to them. And then you've got the Torque of Justice. Uh, <clears throat> so both of these items are both level 10. So they're pretty good when the player characters get them. Uh, so it's plus two and en enhances fortitude, reflex, and will defenses. He uses the next slot. And uh, this property is when you spend a healing surge in addition to gaining its normal benefits, you can choose an enemy you see. Until the end of the turn, you gain a plus two bonus on attack rolls and damage rolls against that enemy. And as daily ability, uh, you can use minor action bloodied allies within five squares if you gain ten temporary hit points. So that's pretty cool. Then we got the, uh, the deck of many things itself. So we've got... Uh, the gem, jester, vizier, oh, moon, knight, skull, which is one you probably don't want to get, uh, balance, fates, flames, throne, idiot, <laughs> I like that one. Uh, the worst card of all to put to draw is the void. This is the one that sucks your soul and 
um, traps it in an unknown location. Sun, Talons, Comet, Rogue, Star, Fool, Key, uh, Donjon, or Dungeon, uh, Uriel, and Ruin. So these are the cards themselves. Uh, if you're into 5th edition and these look familiar, uh, they do have pictures of them in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Um, so the pictures in the Dungeon Master's Guide for the Deck of Many Things was taken from these physical cards. And uh, the back just kind of has like, you know, a couple of dragons there. But it's just such a cool, cool thing. Uh, so this, this is where the original art came from uh, that you see in the 5th edition uh, Dungeon Master's Guide. So that's the deck of many things. Alright, so here we have the uh, the first map. Uh, this first one I pulled out of the box here. And just to show kind of what uh, is included, or what it depicts. So these are some of the different locations that the player characters uh, are likely to explore in the Abbey itself. And we'll just flip this one over. Whoop. And the second side is the Watchtower. And one of the quests um, that Lord Pedreg sends you on, I believe, is to claim the Watchtower. Now, uh, what's interesting is the Watchtower is the, or the location where um, the Far Realm has kind of seeped out and began to corrupt the you know, space and time within the tower itself. So this is actually the area where the player characters can go that has this uh, Far Realm corruption which is pretty cool. So that's the first map, and we'll just have a quick look at the second one. Alright, and here we have map number two. Uh, so a couple of different uh, encounter locations. Uh, so this one here is, as you can probably tell by the big pile of gold, and the corner there, this is where you encounter the, uh, the red dragon. Uh, this map here looks to be part of uh, the catacombs that you can explore. And then just on the other side is actually one full map, and I think this is the main uh, part of the Abbey. So this is one of the larger areas that the player characters uh, can potentially explore. So those are the, uh, the maps. Alright, so the background of the adventure uh, begins about 150 years prior to the current campaign year when this adventure takes place. Uh, and revolves around the keep of Gardmore Abbey itself, a stronghold set up and uh, maintained by a group of knights uh, dedicated to the god Bahamut, so the dragon god. Um, the order, in addition to you know using their forces to protect the nearby area, also uh, use Gardmore Abbey as a place to store evil artifacts and items of power that could potentially. Uh, unbalance the, the scales as far as you know the forces of evil are concerned. So many of these uh, artifacts that were considered unsafe uh, to be out in the wild were taken to the at, to the abbey. Uh, the abbey itself contained some wards and spells that suppressed or negated a lot of the abilities of the items contained within. Uh, now at the beginning of the uh, the background here, so 150 years ago, a horde of orcs led by hill giants um, ended up assaulting the abbey itself. Now what's interesting is that this adventure, this uh, siege that took place of the abbey, uh, was actually written as an adventure that was released in one of the fourth edition dungeon magazines that you can find online. Uh, I did find a PDF of the magazine, so what I'll do is actually include a link to that, uh, that PDF in the description below if you're interested in that as well. So it's a really cool scenario. Uh, the siege ended up start going poorly, and just as, um, you know, shortly after the orcs actually breached uh, the keep itself and managed to make their way into the courtyard, uh, one of the commanders of the, uh, the order, uh, an individual by the name of uh, Havar, turned to the Deck of Many Things. So, it's, uh, getting desperate, he went to the, uh, where the Deck of Many Things was located, drew a single card, and that card ended up being the Face of Death, the Skull card. So once that was drawn, a host of undead and infernal creatures just burst forth, you know, ripped through time and space to make their way into the Abbey and began slaughtering everything within. 
Uh, once this happened, the defenders were pretty well um, without, you know, they were pretty well done at this point, and they were completely wiped out. Uh, over the course of the battle, or once it was fought, uh, several cards from the deck of many things ended up disappearing, along with the uh, the attackers, as well as some of like the undead creatures that were summoned. So what basically happened is normally when you draw from the deck of many things, the deck just disappears and teleports to another location. Uh, the protective wards, however, that were present in the Gardenmore Abbey prevented that from happening. So the deck ended up staying, although some of the cards were scattered. Uh, in total, eight cards were taken outside of the Abbey grounds itself. Now, as the adventure begins, or as a prequel to the adventure, uh, the player characters end up finding one of these random cards uh, at the end of the adventure that they completed prior to this. Uh, now, I actually ran this... Um, I think after the Cairn of the Winter King, I think was the adventure that I ended up running. So it was found within a Dragon's Horde. And it was just a single card at random, but this random card actually dictates a lot of things that happen later on in the adventure. And I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, the player characters begin, uh, I believe, in the town of Winterhaven, uh, where they're given some tasks and some quests to basically um, seek out the deck, you know, draw, finding the card uh, initiates the quest to rebuild the deck, uh, but other individuals may end up sending the player characters towards the, uh, the Gardenmore Abbey itself. So in addition to the multitude of quests that the player characters can find before heading out to the actual uh, Abbey itself, uh, the player characters also have the potential to meet up with uh, one of three, or potentially all three, of a set of special NPCs or patrons that are looking to explore the Abbey for their own purposes. Uh, the first of these is Lord Padraig. He is the ruler of Winterhaven. And he's looking basically to uh, stop the, the orc raiders that are in the nearby area. Um, so the things that he does essentially is, you know, have you scout the abbey itself um, in order to, uh, like, assess the orcs' defenses because the orcs have taken up residence in this keep. Uh, in an attempt to basically reclaim it and take it for their own. Another individual that they may come across is a paladin by the name, or a knight I should say, I don't know if he's actually a paladin, but a knight by the name of Sir Oakley. And his, uh, his quest is basically to cleanse the abbey of the evil that's in there. Uh, one of the locations, in one of the towers in the abbey was actually um, corrupted by uh, a realm of existence known as the Far Realm. And the Far Realm is essentially where, uh, especially in 4th edition, where all the aberrations come from, like Mind Flayers, Beholders. It's essentially like the Lovecraftian, um, you know, uh, type of uh, influenced uh, realm and setting. Uh, so that's actually spread into one of the towers and has completely corrupted it. Uh, one of the things that uh, Sir Oakley wants to do is to cleanse it of that. And then the third potential individual that they may come across is an Eladrin uh, by the name of Berian Felf, uh, Felfarin, and he's basically looking to find the mystery of um, you know what happened to his father, as well as make peace with the uh, the Fey creatures that uh, now inhabit the uh, Abbey grounds. So these three individuals provide uh, the player characters with extra quests that they can go on. So there's a lot of potential information, a lot of potential quests and adventures that the player characters can partake in this, uh, in this adventure, which is really great. So there's a lot of things, a lot of, you know, multitude of different uh, objectives that they can complete. As the DM, you can decide how much time you want to spend on this adventure, if you want to focus on only one of the individuals, maybe two, or if you want to do as many as possible, then you can certainly look at uh, all three of the potential patrons and their quest chains, because they're all separate from one another. Um, now, the player characters don't, again, they don't have to uh, accept any of these extra quests. But what's interesting is that one of these individuals, one of those three NPCs, is actually a secret collector of the deck of many things and is trying to reassemble the deck for their own purposes. And this is where the adventure is really kind of interesting in my opinion. Uh, so you've got the three individuals and what you have down here is a chart that lets you know who the secret collector is and what their motivations are. And this is determined based off of the card that the player characters discover prior to this adventure being run. 
uh, which is actually a really cool thing. It makes the adventures different for a lot of the groups that you would end up, um, you know, potentially playing this. So you could have a group of uh, players or several groups of players all get together, tell their stories of what happened, and they're likely going to have different outcomes or different individuals that they interact with. You know, the DMs may run different quests for the different patrons. Um, so what's recommended to do is early on, I believe it's in book two here, or maybe in book one. Just let me see if I can find it here. It gives you, there we go. So before you run this adventure, one of the things that you have to do is determine who has what cards. Uh, so you have like the cards found by the uh, adventurers, which creates the, the identity of the secret collector, as well as their motivation. Now, this secret collector has sent out a group of adventurers, a rival group of adventurers, and they've collected a few of the cards already at the beginning of this adventure. So, what the, uh, the motivations are for each of the collectors, so Lord Padraig, uh, one of his potential... Um, uh, motivations is abuse of power. So he's looking to uh, recreate the deck of many things as a way of um, giving him the power to unite all the settlements of the Nentir Vale into a nation under his rule. Uh, Sir Oakley is looking for Baham could be potentially looking for Bahamut's reward. Uh, so he believes that Bahamut has promised him uh, the deck of a draw from the deck of many things uh, as a reward for cleansing the temple. Uh, Lord Padraig, going back to him. Could also use the deck of many things to defend Waterhaven or Winterhaven. Sorry, uh, believing that that is the key to say uh, protecting its borders. Um, Barian uh, could look at uh, Fey Revenge, so he's looking to use the deck to wrench the Feywild away from the world. So he's looking to um, you know separate it from where it's crossed over into the Abbey itself. Uh, and then there's Hinder Chaos from Sir Oakley. Uh, he understands the deck of many things is a force of chaos, and he wants to destroy it or lock it away so it can't be used. And then the last one is Sun's Quest. Uh, so this is another one for Barry and the Eladrin. Uh, can use the deck to help him undo the corruption his father suffered in the Watchtower. So uh, it's it's really interesting. Again, you know, the card that you draw basically dictates what um, what the uh, the secret the NPCs the final encounters basically the the secret boss, if you will. Uh, what his motivations are. So I actually have mine filled out. So I actually did this on the computer. So I just uh, had the deck of many things. So the random card that the player characters drew before the adventure started was the Ruin card, which made Lord Padraig the secret collector, and his motivation was the abuse of power. And he had three cards. So the the um, final uh, the secret collector had three cards already in their possession. So he had the Uriel Knight and Gem cards. Uh, the rival adventurers that he sent had already collected the Jester, Moon, Key, and Star cards. Uh, so the encounters with the rival. So that's something else that happens at random. And I think we have it... I think it's somewhere in here. And basically the cards that they have, the cards that they have in their, uh, their collection, lets you know basically what the encounters are when you find them, uh, what their uh, attitudes are like, uh, and where these take place. So that's actually, again, pretty cool. And it just goes through and describes them there. Now, throughout the, uh, the locations that the player characters will visit, uh, several different uh, NPCs or monsters will have some of the cards with them as well. Uh, for example, uh, the Orc Chieftain that's you know, leading the Orcs that have occupied uh, the Abbey have, uh, you know, two car has two cards. So this one had Talons and the Sun card. Uh, in the Wizard's Tower, there was the Rogue card, uh, which is the location that the player characters can go. Inside the Watchtower, that's corrupted by the Far Realm, uh, there's this Beholder that's been affected by uh, the chaos that's in there. And I think we got a picture of him. I already showed him, but I think there's a picture of him in here. At least I hope there is. Or he may be, he may be in this book. So in addition to... There we go. So we've got this Beholder that's affected by the uh, the Far Realm, and he looks really cool. The player characters can also end up fighting a young Red Dragon, and um, he basically just re-established his lair in the Old Abbey. So the player characters can fight some of the two most iconic monsters in Dungeons & Dragons in this adventure, a Beholder as well as a Red Dragon, which is pretty awesome. Um, so yeah, the characters just basically go through 
And uh, as they make their way through, you know, the locations within the Abbey, as they complete the quest and as they encounter some of the NPCs and some of the villains that are there, they have the potential to uh, essentially reassemble the deck. Uh, at the end of the adventure, the player characters are confronted by the final, or the secret collector. And in this uh, combat, uh, the, the rival NPCs, the rival uh, adventuring party, may also be uh, part of that encounter. So they may be on the side of the collector, or they may be uh, potentially against the, the collector. But the adventure essentially ends with the, uh, the final confrontation against the secret collector, reassembling the entirety of the deck, and finding out what to do with it next. So uh, depending on what the, the, uh, the motivations are, uh, the player characters may not necessarily have to fight the Secret Collector, like if they're looking at Sir Oakley's uh, motivation of trying to seal away and destroy the deck, then that would end sort of in, uh, you know, friendly terms. But that's basically how the adventure goes. The player characters explore this fallen abbey, uh, try to drive out the orcs, complete some of the quests, find, search for some of the items like the, uh, like Moonbane, the Longsword, the Torque of Justice and again reassemble the Deck of Many Things. What's interesting is that uh, the Deck of Many Things has limited power even though it's not collected together. Uh, so whenever an encounter takes place uh, with an individual that has a card in their possession, it creates a, um, a glyph on the floor uh, in the encounter area that they're at. And what ends up happening is that glyph can be used for, uh, for certain effects. So let me just see if I can find where that is. So, for example, the card that I had, that the player characters had found at the beginning, uh, before the adventure took place, was the Ruin card. So, what happens is, with this, uh, you know, when the encounter would begin, uh, they had the ability to stand where its token would appear, and uh, I think it indicates on the maps where to put them. And uh, you can use this, uh, this encounter ability, so uh, what it is, you make, you know, uh, this burst three, so three squares out from the, the rune square that the player characters are in. Uh, the player character, I should say, is in. It targets one creature, you make an attack roll of uh, d20 plus 11 versus their fortitude defense. Uh, if you hit, the target is slowed and weakened, and a save ends both. If you miss, uh, the target is slowed until the, your next turn. And the effect is once it's done, you and the t uh, target teleport, swapping places. Uh, so it can only be used uh, once, once per encounter, which is interesting. However, if uh, a villain has the card, so this is just if the player characters have it, or there's an encounter in a room that has the card in it. However, if one of the villains has the card, uh, it has some different effects. So, for example, using the Ruin card uh, that they had, uh, if the villain has the Ruin card, and uses the Touch of Ruin ability, you can choose not to swap places with the target after using the power. Uh, and then whenever the villain hits with the basic attack, the target is also slowed until the end of the villain's next turn. So having a villain with the cards, utilizing their cards, um, makes them a bit more, uh, you know, potentially deadly or challenging, which I think is pretty cool. So it essentially represents the fact that the villains that have the cards, so these would be individuals such as the Secret Collector, um, the uh, Baryon of uh, the Beholder, the Dragon, as well as an undead uh, mage by the name of Vadin Cartwright. Uh, so any of those individuals have spent time with the cards, they kind of know how to use their abilities better, so it makes them a bit more deadly. And that's essentially uh, how the adventure goes. Uh, so with that in mind, I'll just go straight to my final thoughts. Alright, so in conclusion, Madness at Gardmore Abbey is, in my opinion, and in a lot of people's opinions, uh, one of the best adventures that 4th edition had actually uh, released. Uh, there's so much to do, there's so many quests, I mean, I didn't really get to all of them in the, uh, the, the story, like, when I was discussing the story itself, but there's so many things that the player characters can do, there's so many reasons and quests for them to go and explore the Abbey. And with three special NPCs, it expands even further. So uh, it's very likely, I mean, this adventure says it's for characters of level 6 through 8. And you can realistically have characters who start at the beginning of 6th level and gain 8th level by the time that they're done. So there's so much that they can do and so many uh, different stories that they can tell. 
Uh, I just think it's absolutely fantastic. I mean, having a physical copy of the deck of many things is, uh, again, a huge selling point for me. And um, I know I told the story in the previous video, but uh, the backstory of how I got this was kind of interesting. Um, I had a couple of days off of work, and I was really, like, badly sick with a cold. Like, it was terrible. Uh, my nose couldn't stop running, I couldn't stop, like, sneezing and coughing, and it was miserable. But the day that this came out, um, I ended up going to the mall in, my, uh, in the town that I lived uh, to pick up. I was picking up something else, but this came out at the same day. So I actually uh, waited for probably about an hour uh, from the time that I got to the mall to the time that the bookstore opened, hoping that this would be there. Because every 4th edition product that had come out to this point had always been made available on its release day. This is the one thing that they didn't have. So I actually uh, was a bit dejected. I ended up going home and um, thinking about it. There was a bookstore in a different mall in a town that was quite a ways away. It was an hour bus ride away. And I was like, you know what? I gotta try to find it. So I hopped the bus, sick as a dog, and rode for an hour to get to the mall, uh, ran to the bookstore basically, well not run, but you know, I moved as quickly as I can to get to the bookstore. They had one copy, so I snatched it as quickly as I could, and I made my way back, and luckily the same bus that I had taken um, was still there, because I was waiting for another one for transfers, and the driver had actually had to go use the bathroom. So I managed to hop back on the same bus, saving me an hour long wait for the next one to come, made my way home, Again, was miserably sick, but immediately started uh, reading through this and absolutely loved it. Uh, what's great about this is, again, it's sort of a quintessential Dungeons & Dragons experience. Uh, the player characters are exploring, you know, an ancient um, structure that used to belong to this, you know, uh, champions of good type of thing that was overrun. So that's kind of, you know, almost a cliche thing, but it's done pretty well in here. Uh, the player characters are looking to assemble or find an artifact of significance. Uh, one of the more iconic artifacts in Dungeons and Dragons that they can reassemble and uh, they fight some of the more iconic monsters along the way. In addition to like the orcs and ogres and things that you would expect in some of the undead, you get to battle a red dragon and a beholder in the same adventure and not a lot of adventures really did that, which is great. The idea of having the NBC's motivations dictated by randomly determining which cards are in which individual's possession is another really cool aspect. It means that you can have different groups play this, or you could run this adventure potentially a few different times with different groups, and, and none of them are necessarily going to be the same. Uh, so I think that that's a really great aspect of it as well. <clears throat> um, this was one of the higher reviewed adventures that came out during the 4th edition time. Now again, a lot of people really weren't you know on the 4th edition bandwagon, but this review, or when this reviewed, it averaged about 4.5 to 5 out of 5 for the reviews that I had seen. Uh, kind of averaging at 4.8 out of 5. Uh, now again, I don't really rely on numerical scores, but that should indicate how good this adventure is, considering it got such high scores for a time in which the Dungeons & Dragons brand really wasn't doing so well, and a lot of people were hypercritical of it, so this is just, you know, something that is, re again, really highly regarded and reviewed. Uh, one thing I'd like to do at some point would actually be to convert it to 5th uh, edition and run the adventure uh, for a group using 5th edition rules. So, uh, again, this is again one of my all-time favorite adventures. Um, I would probably put this in my top five favorite uh, pre-written adventures of all time, and in my opinion, that's just how good it is. Uh, I love the idea of exploring the Abbey. I love all the different quests that the player characters can go on, from uh, you know finding uh, research, like exploring you know a wizard's tower to find a tome, and uh, you know cleanse it of evil, and you know the fact that it uh, not only features just the locations that are normal that you would expect. But it also has some bleed over from the Feywild, so you get to encounter some creatures there that you may not normally encounter, as well as the Far Realm, which is like the Lovecraftian uh, realm in 4th edition Dungeons and & Dragons, and I'm a huge fan of Lovecraft, so having that in there again is just really great. So um, this is something that I would consider to be, uh, you know, probably one of the best buys that you could possibly get for 4th edition. Uh, it's kind of hard to find now, unfortunately, or it can be kind of expensive now, considering everything that comes inside of it. But if you have the ability to pick this up, whether you're a fan of 4th edition or not, ignore the mechanics, ignore, you know, the way that the NPCs are necessarily constructed and, you know, their powers and stuff like that. Uh, the adventure itself is solidly written. 
and something that I think, you know, with a little bit of work converting it, you can have a lot of fun, even now with a 5th edition group. So thank you guys very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.